We fell behind last time. I let us fall behind because we have like two weeks on circuits and circuits, there's not that much to do. So we didn't talk about capacitors last time. So this time, a full three quarters of the lecture will be about capacitors and the ideas. Because really capacitors, books always, you'd think books would go to resistors first, wouldn't you? Just play along. Yes, we would think that. But no, we do capacitors first because capacitors do a good job of bringing together all the ideas we've been talking about. Charge, fields, how metals behave, voltages, equipotentials. It all comes together in the capacitor really nicely. So that's why we talk about capacitors first. All right. But as our gentle introduction to capacitors, to start, we have to talk about batteries. Ah, yes. Batteries. The bane of my existence this morning is batteries because there's never functional batteries in here. I carry my own batteries. I'm like a high school teacher, you know, that's like, oh, they had to buy their own supplies and yada yada. Same thing's true here. I had to buy my own batteries. There is a very poorly lit battery. There we go. You're probably used to seeing batteries. Uh, that are round with an electron on each side, but there's also these things, 9 volt batteries. Okay, yes. 9 volt, oh wow, look at that. This one's in the witness protection program because it was in an illegal device and it is now, uh, okay, screw it. Okay, batteries. <laughs> well, I'm getting things off my chest. Let me tell you about there's two fields that have their heads so far up their own ass that they can't explain them at all, right? I have read introductory texts on two fields and they just make no sense and it really annoys me. The first one is genetics. Has anybody here taken genetics? Right? The beautiful central dogma should be totally clear. We have genes that have traits. Why are my eyes blue? And you open the book and the first thing is, okay, well this kind of plant has pink petals and this has white petals. Now there's a 50% chance one will have pink petals. I'm like, what the? F <laughs> I thought we were doing genetics. The second one is electrochemistry. Electrochemistry makes no sense at all because they can't explain it because all they say is, well, there's electrons and chemical reactions and then there's the Nernst equation. And then we're all happy. Then we just use the Nernst equation. Electrochemistry, also a horrible field that they cannot explain. I think it's because no one in electrochemistry actually understands electrochemistry. So a battery is an electrochemical device. Therefore, I am not going to tell you how it works because I don't understand how it works because no one has ever explained to me how electrochemistry works. But that's how a battery works, so apparently it does work. There you go. That holds two conducting electrodes. Something about a camel electrode in electrochemistry. I don't know how a camel could possibly be involved. Two conducting electrodes at a constant potential difference. In physics, that's all we care that is happening uh, in here. Oh, batteries. Wow, more batteries. Thank you. Look at that. More electrochemistry. Wow. Okay. So all we care about is uh, the physics of it. So if I were going to draw this battery um, like this, it looks like that. These 9-volt batteries, so you're used to maybe seeing more often like a double A. All right, so double A is round with electrodes on either side. But if you want to catch things on fire with demonstrations, you use a 9 volt battery with the electrodes on the same side. Okay? So I usually will draw this because it's easier to use for drawings and it's more fun to, to play with. Okay, so inside this battery, there's some magic electrochemistry happening. And it's got one electrode here and one kind of funnier shaped electrode there on a 9 volt battery. I'll tell you what that means in a minute, okay? So here we go, here's our bullet points about batteries. One is, um, uh, let's see, uh, uh, EM, this little silly script letter E is called the EMF, the electromotive force. EMF, you may have heard that word before. And it is simply the potential difference that the battery holds the two electrodes at. That's all it is. 
electromotive force EMF in volts, and it's this. Okay, so it's just a fancy name for the battery's delta V. You could say, you know, you could just write delta V on this battery equals 9 volts. It's the same thing. It's an historic word because we used to think about some force pushing electrons around um, in electrochemical circuit. We now know it's not, it's not exactly what's happening, but we still use the word electromotive force. <coughs> uh, let's see. What's really happening? Here's the best I understand it, okay? Despite all those horrible intro books, a battery does chemical work on uh, charges uh, to raise their potential by delta V. Their potential by delta V equal to the EMF. Okay? So it takes a few charges and it says, I'm going to elevate you to 9 volts, and it puts them on one electrode, is one way to think about it. Okay? So uh, let's see. So this is actually the positive electrode, and this on a 9 volt is the negative electrode, the little with the part that sticks out, positive and negative, like that. And if we want to think about the voltage, you've got to decide something. Is you decide where zero is. You decide where is zero volts, okay? When you have a point charge, the whole world kind of agrees that the potential is zero at infinity. So we have that nice little formula we end up with that the potential due to a point charge is kq over r. Because we did the integral from infinity and we said the potential is zero at infinity, that kind of makes sense. It makes sense to make the potential zero off where nothing is really happening. On a battery, there's stuff happening everywhere. So you could say, I'm going to make the most common thing, is say, I'm going to make the negative potential zero volts. You can do that. That would be smart. That's what we're going to do. And then this must be at plus 9 volts. The positive electrode will be at plus 9. If you wanted to, you can make this one zero volts. And this would be at negative 9 volts. You could say, I'm going to define the midpoint between their potentials as zero volts. And you'd be at plus 4.5 and minus 4.5. Do whatever you want. Okay? It really doesn't matter. Because this is a case where there's no obvious place infinitely far away where the potential is zero. This is a case where the potential really is arbitrary. But for now, we're just going to call one side zero volts. That way, the other side is just at the EMF. All right. So now we can apply a little bit of what we learned last time. If we take the, so the electrodes are conductors, OK, uh, that holds conducting electrodes at a constant potential difference. I forgot the important part. No matter what, unless the battery dies. As long as the battery isn't dead, it always holds it at that potential difference. So let's take uh, a conducting wire, like electronics are full of all the time, and attach it here. Right? So there is a conducting wire, like there, metal touching metal, right? and here is a conducting wire hanging off the battery there. So you've seen little connectors on batteries. You just slap it on there, and you have two wires coming off. So we ask ourselves, what is the potential in and around this wire? And we know from last time, whenever you have a conductor, it, the potential on its surface is constant everywhere you go, including inside the metal. So if this metal wire, conductor wire, is touching that conductor electrode, and that electrode is being held at 9 volts, then this is at 9 volts. The whole wire is at 9 volts. Everywhere you go. And if this electrode is at zero volts and the <laughs> conducting wire is touching the conducting electrode, then this whole wire is at zero volts. So this is why we use wires and electricity, is it's a way to just take the battery's electric potential and just spread it wherever you want. Okay? Touch it to your skin and you'll be at nine volts. It's very exciting. Touch it to your tongue and you'll be at nine volts. That You will notice that. Okay, we'll do that in a minute. Oh, I forgot the alcohol wipes. Okay, well, that's good. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm clean. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to start connecting the battery, thank you, to the ideas we've been talking about uh, recently. So let's think about not just in theory how we would make a uniform field, but let's make, let's get real, a real world uniform field 
This is like, you know, what's that engineering class where you go and you solve a problem for a company? What's NG10 something? 100. Thank you for filling in for me. NG whatever. This is like that. We're going to make a real uniform field. The company calls and says, I need a uniform field. What are you going to do for me? Say, so we'll spend a whole semester doing this. A battery connected to parallel plates. A battery connected to parallel conducting plates, which is sort of what I was drawing before when we talked about a uniform field between two plates. But this is how you could really do it. Okay? So say you had a big conducting plate right there. All right? And say you had a big conducting plate here. And note these are in cross-section. Right? So they're really like plates, a plate here and a plate here. It might look like this. Here's an old-timey capacitor. All right? Capacitor. Technically, you can use it for demonstrations. And I can set up all this stuff, and I can go watch and move it. And a little, little knob goes like that. It's very exciting, and you don't know what it means. So I'm really just using it to look at and play with. Okay? So here we go. This is our two plates, like this. So there's lots of area between them. They're very close, but you're seeing them in cross-section. Right? So look at this. All right? This is what's really happening. I can't draw this. Okay, so cross-section of the plates. You get that? We're going to play with the plates. So what we're going to do now is um, hook a battery up to the plates. So here's the battery. This is bigger. Okay, this is a bigger version of the battery. There's the uh, negative electrode. There's the positive electrode. And we would take a wire, and we just talked about a wire means this zero volts to that plate. Now the whole plate's at zero volts because the electrode is conducting and the wire is conducting, and the plate is conducting. So now the whole plate is at zero volts, a zero volt plate. What about the other one? Let's do that. This one is positive. We'll take a wire and touch it to that plate. This was the nine volt electrode, because it will say it's a nine volt battery. The wire is at nine volts, and now this plate is at nine volts. So we could literally do it like this. We could take the thing, Come over here, and if I move it around a little bit, oh, but I gotta get the spacing just right because I don't have any wires. Look at that, and that exciting look. We got a zero volt plate and a nine volt plate. So now, based on what we learned last time, what's going to happen? Let's see. So, this is where it gets a little weird. You got to think, what does the battery do to get this thing up to 9 volts? Okay, so before it connected, it was just a plate, it was neutral, it was a 0 volts. If we had a test charge, or say we had a region of space that was at 0 volts, what would, we, what would we do to raise its potential? With a point charge, we'd say put a point charge right there. Then it'd have a higher potential, right? Because the potential of a point charge, you know, drops off, it goes to infinity on the charge, and it drops off to 0, right? So V versus x, and that's there, you'd say, okay, I made it up like that. Take the point charge away, the potential goes back to zero. So the way to get this plate up to nine volts is the battery sends some positive charge to it. So the battery's not dumb, it knows what to do. It puts some charge on that electrode and says, okay, it feels like it's at nine volts. The chemical reaction is happy. I really know how an electrochemistry system works. Okay, put some positive charge there, that's at nine volts, that's what the electrochemical cell says to do. And then you attach a wire, and it says, oh, wait, I need more charge to get the whole thing to 9 volts. So actually, charge flows out of the battery. And then you touch it to this huge plate, and it says, oh, I've got to send more charge. Okay, so it'll send whatever charge has to be sent to hold this conductor at 9 volts. If you made the plate 100 times bigger, it would take 100 times more charge, and more charge would flow out of the battery. That's what the battery does. It's an electrochemical device that holds two conducting electrodes at a constant potential difference, no matter what. If you attach another electrode, it'll also be at 9 volts because it has an infinite amount of charge to keep sending. Okay? Now, what's a little weird, bothers people, is that I said this was at 0 volts. But I'm going to say it also it puts a negative charge on that plate. What, what the, what? But you said it's at 0 volts. Isn't that neutral? No! 0 volts does not mean neutral. 0 volts means near 0 volts. I could have put this at 0 volts, and then this would be at minus 4.5 volts. And you'd say, oh, yeah, well, that makes sense. Right? But the, where is zero is irrelevant. All that matters is the difference is 9 volts. Okay? So don't look at that and say it must be neutral. The voltage never tells you if something is neutral. Okay? The voltage on plates is just the difference. Um, 
Because because the one rule, the one thing that will happen here is the battery will always send the same charge to the left and to the right. And that's about how it's really happening, right? There's really electrons are the only free uh, charge particle in these systems. So what's really happening is to make this one happy, it's flowing a bunch of negative charge here, and we know that has to leave positive charge there. Right? The battery, even though it can cause charge to flow, is neutral. And the plates are neutral. All we can do is redistribute charge. So the battery really can't just put charge here and nothing there. It's not like rubbing a cat on the inside. Like, you know. okay? All it's doing is moving charge by giving it energy. So we have to have the same charge on this plate that we have on that plate. They'll always be equal and opposite. Some 102 problems are written so that it is not, but I don't think we we're going to go that far. Okay, okay, zero volts, nine volts, plus, minus. Well, I'm reading this text. See if you can draw the field lines between those two plates. Question is, so the battery is polarizing the plates, sort of. I mean, you're saying the right things, but let's think technically what polarizing means. The battery is polarizing the entire system. Right? Technically, if you said polarize this plate, I would say put positive on this side of the plate and negative on that side of the plate. Technically, that's polarizing a plate. But you're right, it is polarizing. It's just driving the polarization of the whole thing, of the two plates and the battery all together. So good thinking, slightly incorrect use of the word polarizing. But the idea is what you're saying is probably right. Okay. <clears throat> so before if we wanted to polarize something, we had to bring an external charged object near it. So that's weird. This is a way to do it with chemistry inside the battery. Uh, I made a mess. OK. Let's see. So let's see. So the result of this is equal and opposite charge on the plates. Okay, so we have plus Q over here. We have to have minus Q over there. Um, let's see. What else do we know? Uh, the plates are equipotential surfaces. Right? That's why this one goes to 9 volts, this one goes to 0 volts. So the plates, because they're conductors, plates are equipotential surfaces. Feel free to text me fields that you think do a terrible job of explaining themselves, and I will share it with the class if there's a specific field, and I know what's coming. Um, now let's think about the field lines. How would you draw the field lines of this geometry? So we talked before about parallel plates. These are parallel plates. So this is the way you make a uniform field. Um, it creates a uniform field uh, between the plates. Between the plates, OK? And which way does it go? OK. So I hooked up a really huge extension cord to a battery Oh, I love these hypotheticals. OK, here we go. If I hooked up a really huge extension cord, I assume you mean long, to a battery, but didn't connect it to like a bulb or anything, the battery would still run out of juice quickly. Yes. I mean, it would have to be you know, like around the Earth huge, probably. Well, we could calculate it. I'll calculate it for next time. OK. Um, yeah. Creates uniform field. So now we've got to think about which way is the field. So maybe you've already studied so much, you know which way the field is between two plates. Uh, but if you don't know, you've got to think about that little test charge. Right? What would a little positive test charge feel in this situation? It would feel attracted to this plate and repelled from that plate. It's repelled from like charges. It's attracted to opposite charges. So we feel a force that way. And if a little positive test charge feels a force that way, that means the field is that way. So we could draw a uniform field like that, make all the vectors the same size, you know, Kind of like that. There's all your E field vectors. So parallel plates or parallel charged planes is the geometry that gives you a uniform field. Now technically, they have to be infinite. Okay? You won't really get a uniform field perfect between two plates if I drew them like this. They have to be infinitely wide and infinitely tall and everything. But if they're not infinite and you just get them really close, uh, then you get a good approximation to a uniform field and the formula is about right. Really, on the edges, the field will kind of do this, kind of like two charged particles or something like that. It'll start to curve on the edges. It's called the fringe field. But if you look at these plates and you imagine, OK, those are pretty big plates. I mean, you know, for a dessert, OK? So if I were to bring them together where they're only, you know, sub-millimeter apart, and you're in the very between, in the middle, 
you'd say, okay, these are pretty much infinite because I'm only, you know, a sub-millimeter away from a 10-centimeter plate. So that's practically infinite in physics. Is there a reason the test charges are positive instead of negative, or is it just convention? It is a convention. It's Benjamin Franklin set it up. He screwed it up. Okay, electron obviously should have been positive. So you can blame his, uh, his uh, what are the people that come after you when you're long gone? What are those called? His what? Descendants. Yes, you can blame his descendants. Um, so hopefully you were able to think about that and see that. Uh, let's see. Um, now, what are, the, what are the equipotential surfaces going to look like? Yes. Let's see. The equipotential surfaces, well, you know that a metal conductor is an equipotential surface. So if I wanted to draw one, I'd say there's one right along this surface. That's one. That would be the 9-volt equipotential surface. And this must be the 0-volt equipotential surface. But if you wanted to draw more, you would say, well, I remember that to stay on an equipotential surface means we stay at the same potential, hence the name. To stay at the same potential means to stay at the same potential energy, which means I need to move in a way that doesn't change my potential energy, which means I have to move perpendicular to the field. So if I were going to draw one, I'd put one right in the middle, like that. <clears throat> There's an equipotential surface. You could draw another one between those two, cut it down you know, to a fourth equipotential surface, and there's another one. Have them nice and evenly spaced. Okay. Um, so then you get equipotential surfaces surfaces are parallel to the plates, and that's just because of the uniform field geometry. It's because the field goes perpendicular to the plates, and evenly spaced. And the reason they're evenly spaced, I don't think we actually, I was going through my notes trying to decide if we derived this or not. I think we didn't, but I think I'll just say it in words and give you the answer, okay? They're evenly spaced because if you think about, uh, if I want to go like a, a certain unit of energy or potential, I would calculate that, or if I wanted to change my potential energy by a certain amount. In this case, it's the work you do pushing against the field, okay? The work you do pushing against the field, say I'm a little test charge plus I want to go this way. I want to go to higher potential. So we just integrate the work. But the work is the force times the distance. Right? But the force is the little test charge times the electric field times the distance. But the electric field is constant. Okay? So the work I do as I move is constant. So if, say I want to increase my potential by a, a joule. Yeah, a joule. I might have to move this far to get up by a joule. If I want to go by a joule again, I move this far. A joule again this far. Right, because the electric field is constant, how much work you do just depends on how far you go. So how much work you do is proportional to the, the distance or the displacement you move. So because of that, the energy, the distance between the same energy is constant, and that's what the equipotentials are. You just divide it by Q, right, and it's the same thing. Okay? So all you really need to know, if, if that sort of mental calculus worked for you, is that delta V between the plates is the electric field times the delta X. That's for really for any uniform field. If you're in a uniform field and you move delta x um, parallel to the field, you know, it doesn't, I mean, you go perpendicular to the field, you get nothing. But in a uniform field, if you go parallel to field, I'll say delta x parallel to E, either with it or against it, that's, that's the relationship. Okay? And that's why, these, that's why we like to draw these evenly spaced, because then they're equipotentials at a uniform uh, distance. Is potential energy equal to negative work or positive work? It depends on if it's external work or internal work. If you do external work on a system, the potential energy change is positive because you put energy into it. If you let it do the system do its own work, that's called internal work, and then that's a negative potential energy change because you made some kinetic energy. Okay. Uh, let's see. So uh, the next one is a problem. Yeah. Um, how do you calculate E? So that's what I'm showing you here. So we're going to be calculating E more in a minute. But in this case, to calculate E, one way, there's two ways. E for these parallel plates. One, if you know the charge density, it's sigma over epsilon naught. However, if you know the potential difference in delta x, if you can solve that equation for E, you're there. All right? E is delta V over delta x. So that's the two ways to get the field. It just depends on what kind of a problem it is. It might be a problem where you have charge densities, and we talked about this, or we at least gave you this before. Or it might be a problem where you're told two plates are at 9 volts and they're a centimeter apart. What's E? Okay. 
This stuff is very conceptual. The equations are very short, but the thing, oh, that was my next two bullets. There you go, thank you very much. So how do you get the field? Bullet, either from the charge density or from the potential and the delta x. Now, deep questions like, why does this one not depend on the spacing is vector, it's field theory. We have to do Gauss's law to get into that, so we don't want to do Gauss's law. Okay, so that's the basic connections, okay? We got charge coming out of a battery, flowing onto plates, equipotentials and fields, and how it changes with space. So now, I know y'all like to do practice problems, and I want to get some bon homie ego in here, so I'm gonna give you a practice problem that we're gonna look at together. It's not super hard, but just to kind of get going, to calculate a few numbers and to think about energy and yada yada. Oh, there's my beautiful, brilliant movie. Ah. Doo -doo -doo. Oh. oh, look at the shadow. There we go. Think about that for a second while I read these two. We'll do that real quick. It's just an illustration of what we've been talking about. Uh, test charges are positive. Yes, yes, okay. Okay, well, let, let me just say a couple things. I don't know, you can think about that or listen to me. That's your choice. Uh, I th think we talked about this last week, or maybe it was a page of my notes I skipped. Um, if you have two, forget about the battery, forget about potentials. If you just have two charged planes facing each other, this is the field in between them. This is the permittivity of free space. It's a constant. It's the same as K. It just has missing some four pi's and you don't invert it, okay? So I uh, have that over there. Uh, uh, K, that K we've been using, 9 times 10 to the 9, is 1 over 4 pi, this epsilon naught, permittivity of free space. Some kinds of physics like to use epsilon naught. Some parts of physics like to use K. It's whichever one makes the equation easier. When you're calculating electrostatic forces and fields for point charges, you tend to use K, because then it's just K, Q, Q over R squared. If you're calculating the fields between things, it's a lot nicer to use epsilon naught. If you want, you could write that the E field is four pi k sigma. Okay, so that's just a constant, permittivity of free space, 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12, uh, don't worry about the unit. 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12, it's in the front cover of your book. This is the charge density. Sigma usually means something per unit area. Okay, so it is Q over A. So whatever total charge we have here, divided by the area of the plate, it's just sigma is Q over A. It's just a density, okay? So I don't remember if we said those in detail, or it's definitely in the book, uh, those ideas. Uh, why doesn't a test charge feel more force from one of the plates than the other as it gets closer? You're asking, why does this create a uniform field? We have to do Gauss's law and more field theory. I can't explain it, sorry. Um, Oh, but I could, oh, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to. What's the delta x in the drawing? What is it? Uh, the delta x is just how far you go. You know, like the spacing between, you know, the delta v anywhere in here, just delta x. I moved delta x, what delta v did I go through? So x is the one dimensional, is the dimension we care about. Okay, let's look at this. We're gonna, I mean, it's all gonna be illustrated in this problem. That's why we're doing this problem. Let's do this problem, here we go. It's the same drawing right, that we just did. An electron jumps from the negative plate to the center of some parallel plates at nine volts. Okay, so pretty much the same thing we just did. Here's a plate, except I'm gonna be tricky and put the positive one on this side. Here's a plate, must be the negative plate. I'm gonna put uh, nine volts between them. All right, so if we look in here, there's nine volts. That's not a standard way to draw it, but you get the idea. Positive plate, negative plate, nine volts. We could say, which way is the field? Positive test charge, it's always from, uh, it's always that way. Uniform field like that. Here's the equipotentials like that. We know we might call this zero volts and this nine volts. What would the middle be? 4.5 volts. Because that equation says E equal, or delta V is E delta X. So that's just basically saying since E is constant, it's like a slope, it's like a linear line. You know, it's saying that this delta, any unit delta x you go, you're going to do a, a unit uh, delta v. Uh, can you review charge plates more generally? What I said is all I can say about charge plates. It creates that electric field. We would have to do two weeks of field theory to prove it. That's it. 
The electric field between two plates is sigma over epsilon naught. That's all there is. That's probably why I did it so fast last time. Is that all, that's all we're saying. Yeah. Um, is there nothing to review? Uh, let's see. Okay, so here, then the question was, um, the question was, an electron jumps from the negative plate to the center between the parallel plates. Okay, so an electron is right here. This is the negative plate. I said zero volts, but it's more negative than that plate. That's why it's the negative plate. And we're saying a little electron, a little E minus tells you it's not the unit, it's the electron with a little minus sign there, uh, jumps to here. Okay? Somehow, it jumps from the zero volt plate to the middle. Okay? How much potential energy does it lose or gain? Okay. So one way we'll make these questions more real is to ask you for the energy, not just the potential. But to see if you really remember how you link the two, that they really are the same thing. So first, if I were looking at this, I'd say, well, why don't I think about the potential first? What, w how, what was the potential change? Because I'm used to thinking about the fields and the potentials. Okay, so it started from initially here to finally there. Went from the zero volt line to the middle and then you'd have to say, well, what is, what is the potential of the middle? Um, 4.5, right? Because we know it goes uniform from 0 to 9. So in the middle, it's at 4.5. Um, what, how did we write this equation? Before? I'm trying to think if that's the best way to explain that. I mean, I like it. Uh, you could say, yeah. You could say this. We want the potential change, and here's all you know is that delta V equals E delta X, right? So you could say, well then, what if I want to solve for the field in between? Solve for field in between. You would need to know the spacing of the plates D. Okay, we didn't give you that in this problem. You don't really need it. You'll see why you don't need it here in a minute. But I'd say, okay, what is uh, the field? And the field is, this constant field value is 9 volts over D. Say if it was one centimeter, let's pretend we had that number. You don't need it, it'll go away. It'll cancel out. Right. So electric fields can be, uh, a unit for electric field can be the volt per meter or the volt per centimeter. So it'd say it's nine, okay? Equals nine volt per centimeter. And then you just use this equation again. And you say, okay, what is the delta V? If I say, okay, the field is nine volt per centimeter everywhere. And now, what is my delta x? It's half the distance. It's 0.5 centimeter. OK. So what's that going to be? 9 volt per centimeter is a field everywhere. If I moved half the distance, 0 0.5, 4.5. 4 4.5 uh, volts is delta v. So it's just this idea that the potentials change linearly from one to the other. If you move halfway, you use up half the potential. If you just called this d, the d would have canceled out. D over D you cancel out. So you know that the electron jumped from 0 volts to 4.5 volts. Right. So, but that, it didn't ask for that. It asked for energy. So you've got to remember the relationship between energy and potential. And you think, oh, if you, even if you can't remember it, even if you, your formula sheet in the exam fell and did that thing where the wind catches it and it's gone, no formula sheet. You remember that these electrostatic ideas, delta V is just mechanics ideas, delta U per charge. Right? The electric field was a force per charge. The potential was a potential energy per charge. And then you get your sheet and you check, and that's correct. Okay? But we're asking for a change. One thing we pointed out here is how much potential energy does it lose or gain? So clearly we're talking about a change. Oh my god, talking about a change here. So we've got to think V final minus V initial equals U final minus U initial over the charge, which is negative one point six times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. It's negative because it's an electron, right? V final minus V initial is a positive 4.5 volts. It was at zero, went to 4.5. 4.5 minus zero equals, I'm gonna write it as delta U again, over minus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Sorry, it's getting messy. There you go. So that zero goes away. And you multiply 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, negative times 4.5, and you get delta U is negative, negative 7.2 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Okay, so we have a negative sign. We went to a higher potential, 
But since it's a negative charge, it lost potential energy. And then you could say, does that negative mean lose or gain? So you could just say, well, it's negative, it means lose. Right? The final must have been lower than the initial. That's why it's negative. But if you wanted to physically check that, I would say this little electron, as it went from here to here, did an external agent have to push it, or did it just go woo and go down a slide? It went woo, right? Because it feels a repulsive force from these negative charges and an attractive force of that negative charge. So that was a case where it was happy to go from there to there. The field drove it, and it gained kinetic energy. That's why it lost potential energy. Then the only other thing is one of the homeworks you learned about EVs, electron volts, is another kind of energy. And all you're doing there is instead of writing negative 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, you write minus 1E. And when you multiply minus 1E times 4.5V, you get minus 4.5EV. An EV is just an electron, electro, funda uh, a fundamental electric unit, fundamental charge unit times a volt. And it's just a way to avoid writing 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs all the time. And it's sort of an atomic scale energy. You know, you notice it's kind of a small number. But if you write it in EV, it's minus 4.5 EV, which is more reasonable kind of a number. Oh, this is so confusing. Let's see. Uh, even though the electron is negative, it still gains potential. No, it, lost, it gains potential. Uh, it lost potential energy. Right? It went to a state of higher potential in terms of the, the field, but it loses potential energy because it's negative. Did you just arbitrarily pick D to be one centimeter to find V? No. I arbitrarily picked D to be one centimeter to give you a value of the electric field to make you feel better. Okay, but I didn't have to. I could have just called it D, and here I just could have called this D, and those Ds would have canceled. Okay? So I just tried to give you an intermediate step so you could think about the field a little bit, but you really didn't need to solve for the field. All that really matters is you know this potential varies linearly with position. So if you go halfway, then that's half the voltage. Because you know the equipotentials are evenly spaced. Ooh, man. We got through three of 16 boards. I didn't expect to get through all of them. Wow, okay, it's time for the break. Okay, let's keep going. So much to do. <clears throat> We're talking about capacitors and you thought oh he was going to talk about capacitors and he didn't that's what this is it's all a capacitor there you go two plates um, with opposite charge hooked up to a circuit which is kind of what the battery was is what a capacitor is um, we're going to focus on the special kind the parallel plate capacitor which is what we've been doing the two parallel plates parallel plates but what their real purpose is is to store charge, but not really. So in parentheses, I'll put energy. That's really what you're storing with a capacitor. You're doing it by storing charge. Energy is sort of more the point in a circuit. So the level of circuit sophistication we're going to get to is to understand how resistors and capacitors behave over the next few weeks. Okay, so we do need to understand the fundamental uh, capacitor. So let's draw that yet again. I'm going to put the zero volts on the left this time. Ooh, the Southern IVs. And I'm going to put nine volts on the right this time. No, I'm going to put plus V. We're going to get more. Yeah, there you go. Zero on the left, plus V on the right. And uh, there's the battery. Let's see. The plus is this one, and there's that one. And I'm going to take a wire and hook it up there, and I'm going to hook it up there. And you know what all that means. That means to get this thing up to plus V, we're going to put some plus charge on it. So some positive charge will leak. And I will be calculating how long of an extension cord would it take to drain a battery when you hook it up. It's really a capacitance problem. Um, let's see. So what we want to think about, though, and then, of course, what else do we know? We know that's going to create an electric field uh, going this way in between, and I could draw the equipotentials, but let's not bother, it makes it messy, okay? What is delta V? Delta V is the EMF of the battery. Or, well, delta V is that V right there, right? Because the difference of those plates is now V. The battery puts out EMF of V. Okay, so there's two ways to think about this as a device. Okay, I'm telling you this is an electronic device that has to go in circuits. And one way is to uh, focus on the charged plates. Charge on plates. 
Okay, if we focus on that, we say we have two plates, they have charge on them. You'd say, okay, the more charge, the bigger uh, you're going to get delta V, and the bigger you're going to get E. All right, I mean, that all makes sense. Remember, the E field between them is equal to sigma over epsilon naught, charge density over epsilon naught. So if I put more charge on this finite size plate, charge density goes up. So more charge means a bigger field. Bigger field means the potential has to change by even more as you go from line to line to line. So everything goes up together. So one way to think about it is I'm really thinking about the charge on the plates. And you cannot even worry about the battery. Right? If I put more charge on the plates, the battery uh, or the potential has to go up. So that doesn't make sense with a battery. That's just if I just have two, char two plates. I'm just thinking of them as a capacitor. But you could also say, no, I want to think about the battery. So let's think about the battery on the plates. Okay, so sort of what you're thinking, which one is the constant? Are we saying that you have a constant charge on the plates, and then you calculate E and you calculate delta V? Or you could say you have uh, the more delta V you have. Oh, let's just say, yeah, let's say the more delta V you have, the more charge in the bigger field. And the bigger field. I mean, both happen. Bigger E. Okay? So the point of that, I mean, there is no contrast there. They all go up together. The contrast is kind of when you're thinking about capacitors and solving problems, it's is it a constant charge problem where we told you Q, use the Qs to get delta V and delta E, or is it a constant potential problem where we said it's attached to a battery? So delta V is set, and you use that to calculate the charge in E. You can kind of think of it either way, okay? But either way, they both follow the same equation. Either way, they're going to say this, that the charge on the plates is proportional to delta V. Okay, we could go through the math. We're going to go through the math to calculate, to, show, to prove it's proportional in a minute. But right now, I'm just telling you it's proportional. What's the E on the battery? Is that epsilon? This is, this is the electric field of the battery here. And th these are all E's. I haven't written epsilon down anywhere. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so what is the constant of proportionality between these two? It's C, the capacitance. All right. So we're just saying that the bigger the charge, the bigger delta V in a linear fashion, and this constant of proportionality between them is delta V, or is the capacitance. It's how much charge it can hold. Okay? And it's in farads. F A R A D, short for Faraday, and the symbol is big F. Okay? So a one farad capacitor is a really big capacitor. They tend to be microfarads or nanofarads or picofarads. Okay, let's see. So again, the point of this was just to say, you could think of its capacitance is, if I give it a certain Q, how much delta V does it take? Or if I give it a certain delta V, how much Q does it take? They go up and down together. And you can just think of one as constant or the other as constant. E equals delta V on the battery. Oh, that's, the, I'm sorry, that's the EMF E, not the epsilon. That's, that, that's a special symbol. You have to like go into word, into the special symbol category in the math section to find that EMF. It's just a scripty curly E. It has no uh, historical context. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Okay, so now what we want to do is get a formula for the capacitance. This is sort of how it fits into the big picture. It's the constant of proportionality between Q and delta V. Let's calculate the capacitance for how about parallel plates? That would be the way to go. This one goes up. This one stays down. And this is the one I hold. Yes, OK, here we go. OK, so calculating capacitance, three easy steps. Really, we just need a formula that tells us what is Q from delta V or what is delta V from Q. But we don't have that. All the formulas we've derived have been in terms of the electric field. So we just have to use our electric field terms and then just cancel something. Okay, so let's draw it again real quick. So here's our capacitor. We've got the two plates. We're going to give you a few more variables now because the geometry is important. 
Okay? So the area of those plates is A. Because right? we have to start thinking about charge densities to do this. Um, they each have Q on them, plus Q and minus Q. They always have equal and opposite charges. The electric field, of course, goes from plus to minus Q. Best, a test charge would run away. And the separation we'll call D. Right? So there's your capacitor. So we want to figure out what is C? So we've got to use our electric field. So I'm telling you just the steps. There's no mathematical law that says this is how you have to do it. This is years of experience messing these up. So start with the relation between Q and E, the electric field. Because that we know, right? That's the one we have. We know, again, this is the review. It's sigma over epsilon naught. That's all we're telling you, okay? But we can remember what was sigma is the charge density, all right? So it's really equal then to Q over A, there's sigma, epsilon naught. Right? That's how you get the electric field between the plates. That's the E. Now that we're giving you a little more geometry, we're telling you the area of the plate for the first time, okay? And then, you look at, so once you have that, you put that in your pocket for a minute now. We have E in terms of the geometry and the charge. And now we look at the relationship uh, between E and delta V. E and delta V, the potential between the plates. So remember we talked about that one over here. We said it's just this thing, delta V equals E delta X. All right, so let's go all the way across, all the way across to D. Therefore, we'll do the whole delta V of the plates. Remember, if we went halfway, we just got half the delta V. But we want to write this in terms of the whole delta V. So we'll say that E, the electric field in the plates, is the full delta V across the plates over D. So one thing to keep in mind, I don't want to mess up the notation and make it more complicated, but when you say delta V with two plates, you've got to know what you mean. Okay? In that problem, delta V was between one plate and halfway. That was half the gap. Here, I'm saying by delta V here, I mean the full plate gap. Delta V all the way across here. So I'm actually not giving you any notation to make that absolutely clear. It's just sort of context. Clearly, we mean all the way across the whole plates because that's why we put a D there. In a problem, you might say, oh, it's half D or something like that. Okay? But here, this is the delta V that the two plates experience. It's all the way across. And then three, step three, is just equate them for E and equal them. You know, three equate for E. We just solve these for E. So we say, oh, it must be that Q over A epsilon naught, that's that one's E, equals delta V over D. All right? So all we've done is taken two separate ideas and combine them to see what kind of an equation we get. And we're trying to get an equation like this. We want to see what's the relationship between how much charge do you get for how much potential you put in. Well, there it is. All we've got to do is rearrange it. Right? So we just say Q, ah, that's a theta. Q is um, epsilon naught usually goes in front because it's a fundamental constant. Right? Epsilon naught, and then the geometrical variables make the little fraction. Okay? That's just style points right there. If you write A over D delta V epsilon naught, people will laugh at you. Okay, so write it like this. Epsilon naught, A over D, and then times uh, delta V. All right? And look how I put these right on top of each other. Huh? Teaching reviews, look at that. Look at these, right? Almost parallel, right? Q something times delta V. There's the same Q and the same delta V. So this must be the capacitance right here. Okay, now we're going to stop and we're going to reflect on that for a moment. Let's see. Can you differentiate all the E's, please? Curly boy, half circle boy, and regular E. <laughs> okay. This is the EMF. This is the permittivity of free space. It equals 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 farads per meter, if we've got to get technical. This equals the voltage, in more common parlance, of the battery. 
And then E is the field. And if you want to get technical, I got to put the freaking, you know, the arrow on it and the magnitude around it. I always mean the magnitude like that. Okay, there you go. That's the three. Mine always look very different. I don't know what you're talking about. I could do the rest of the alphabet to distinguish them if you would like, because mine look completely different. Um, okay, what we got to do now is we got to really get into this. We got to really enjoy it. We got to really think about what it means, because here's the big point. Okay, let me just go ahead and switch to over here. Um, the big point is that this capacitance that we just calculated, this ability to store charge and energy, only depends on geometry. That's the interesting part, the capacitance, therefore, which we defined as the ability to store charge and energy, C, for parallel plates, is epsilon naught A over D. All right. Okay, that's a C. There's nothing on it. So let's look at our capacitor. What does it depend on? It depends on epsilon naught, the permittivity of free space, 8.85 to 10 to the minus 12. That's the same everywhere in the universe, maybe. Everything we've studied close up, it's the same. So that's a universal constant. A is the area of each plate. So you could look at this, this and say A is literally pull it apart, get out a ruler, measure the diameter, say 1 half A times that squared, get it wrong because you forgot it's the radius, 1 half A uh, pi times the radius squared. It's the area of that plate. And D is just the separation between the plates. And that's the only things that tell you how much charge it's going to store. So the point is, it's independent of how much voltage you put on it or how much charge is on it. It's a, it's a, it's a geometric property of the object. Uh, geometric property of the object. Right? It doesn't depend on what's happening electrostatically. Those two plates have a capacitance right now. It doesn't matter if I have charge on them or not. If I put a battery on it, they have the same capacitance. They get different charges and different potentials, but they have the same capacitance. Okay? So this is why it's a fundamental property. It's not something that changes and depends on stuff. It's a property of, of two plates. Okay, good lord. Let's see. That's that capacitance. Um, I usually calculate one, but I didn't bring any notes to calculate one. I could just make up numbers. That seems kind of stupid. Let's see. But I mean, why would that stop me, really? Um, let's calculate the capacitance of two quarters in your pocket. Okay? If you had two quarters in your pocket, two little metal discs, and say they happened to be sitting just right. One was like that, and one was just somehow your pocket, it just, there's a spacer somehow, okay? So what's the diameter of a quarter? It's an inch, all right? So if, uh, D of a quarter is 25.4 uh, millimeters. So R is 12.0, oh, I'm really screwed now, millimeters, okay? Uh, and let's say you somehow have them sitting where they're one millimeter apart. Like that, a little gap. Let's calculate the capacitance. It's literally just A and D. C equals 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 uh, farads per meter. A is pi times, let's put this in, uh, let's do it all in meters. Point uh, zero one two seven. wait, 12.7, two, two, two. Oh, it's not that big, is it? Wait a minute, I'm off somewhere. The radius is that, that, oh yeah, that's about right. 0 0.0127 meters squared over, and what was D? One millimeter, 10 to the minus three meters. That's in meters squared. Right, meters squared over meters is meters, farads per meter, it's all gonna turn out to be farads. Right? So we would just need to estimate what that number is. And you can actually be better at this than you think, right? First of all, minus 3, minus 12, minus 9. That's kind of like an eighth, isn't it? It's kind of like a hundredth, a tenth of an eighth. It's a tenth of an eighth. Boop. Eight. There we go. One, two, five. Call it eight. Close enough. Oh, shit, there's a pie there. 
Um, so point that eight, and that'll be one, and that'll go away. This thing's now gone. Oh, it was squared. Oh, never mind. It's a really small number. Okay, I didn't do the calculation ahead of time, but you'll get something like picofarads. Ten. I mean, I could have estimated the magnitude, but now I've screwed it up. So it's going to be very small. I'll let somebody calculate it if they want. Or well, ten to the minus twelve farads, not picofarads. Okay. So the point of that is you could calculate the capacitance for something that has absolutely nothing to do with an electronic circuit. Just two conductors next to each other have a capacitance. It doesn't matter if it's in a circuit or not. And uh, it's, they're not very big. They're very small because this universal constant is, is really small, 10 to the minus 12. Is 10 meters the distance. Uh, ten, so the distance I was saying was 10, one millimeter apart. So 10 to the minus 3 was there. Then I just started trying to do math live. Sometimes I can do. I didn't, know, I didn't pull it off that time. OK? If we were in another class, uh, <gasps> no, if we were in another class, you could calculate this for any geometry. It doesn't have to be parallel plates. But we're focusing on parallel plates because that is how a, a capacitor is really made. OK? We could also, so let, all we got to do is talk about energy. Let's talk about the energy that we store. So you now know how, much, how to calculate the charge stored in a capacitor. Because you can calculate C. Epsilon not A over D, and you can say, well, if it's got 10 volts on it times that C, now how much charge it has in it. Cool. But you often don't really care about, okay, don't worry about this calculation. Okay. <laughs> don't ask me questions about this. Don't worry about it. It was just for fun. I will make a video of the quarters in my pocket capacitance later. Don't worry about those numbers. But what is the capacitor really storing? It's really storing energy. That's what we really care about. We don't really say, in a phone, you know, how, many, how much charge is the battery going to go through? We care about the energy in a capacitor. So let's look at that formula real quick. This is just one of those that you'll have or memorize. But it's good to think a little bit about where it comes from. Okay? Because if you think about the capacitor, here it is. We'll get a little bit circuit-like now. Look at that. Oh, the drawings are getting less detailed. But that's the electro electrical symbol for a capacitor, and it looks like what it is. Two wires coming to two parallel plates. This one has a delta V on it. It has a potential difference, of course, because one side is positive and one side is negative, like that. And it has some capacitance C. Even when there's no delta V on it and no charge, it still has capacitance C. A neutral capacitor, well, they're always neutral. An uncharged capacitor has capacitance as well. Whoa. I just saw something fall. Okay. I got to stop drinking so much coffee. Um, okay. So you look at this thing and you say, okay, we got plus Q over here. We got minus Q over here. So if I were to hold you down and say, tell me, what is the energy? You would say, well, I've got 2Q at a voltage of delta V. So the energy, so let's see, I've got uh, plus or minus Q at delta V. So you'd say, is it 2Q? Delta V, I'd say no. It's not that. And you would think it is because that's the whole idea is when you move a charge around in a potential, we talked about like in a uniform field, which this is, you know, if we have a field like this, and we have field lines like this, and I have a charge, and I move it from here to here, the energy was just the charge times delta V. So if I have all this 2Q at delta V, why isn't it just 2Q times delta V? So it's actually a half Q times delta V. So we're off by a factor of four. Okay, well, why? Okay, let's why. Oh, I forgot to put no. I lost track of my dialogue here. Okay, here we go. Why? Um, first of all, the reason this first two is wrong is because you get plus and minus Q by moving one electron. You know what I mean? <coughs> So it's like, why, if we were to move one electron from one side to the other, this would be minus one E, and this would be plus one E. How many charges actually moved across? One. Okay, so the fact that this is the reason we always say the charge on the capacitor is Q. And yes, there's plus Q on one side and minus Q on the other side. But every calculation you do, you never double it. You never use both charges. You always just think of Q. And that's the reason. You move one charge, E, and you get a charge plus or minus E. But you never mess with two E, you only move one. Okay, so always, don't ever think of it as two E. That's how you get rid of the first two. Okay. 
Okay. We get those two by moving one point. Get the plus and minus charge of moving one point. But then why is it a half? The real answer is a half. Why is it a half? So that one. Um, my mic isn't working. Oh, the battery's died. The battery's died on my mic. I'm not going to change it now because no one really wants to hear me that badly, and there's only four minutes left. Um, the other reason is when the first charge was transferred. first charge was transferred, what was delta V? Oh, when it was neutral, move that very first little baby charge, what was delta V? Before we moved anything, what was delta V? I'm going to change the battery until somebody shouts out the number for what delta V was. Whenever I ask for a number, what is it always? We talked last time about when I asked for a number, it's always, and the number is... Removed. Ah, if it's the very first charge we ever moved, then there's no charge difference on the plates, right? And if there's no charge difference on the plates, what's delta V? Zero, right? So when the first charge is transferred, delta V was zero, all right? So all the charge didn't move delta V. That's the reason it's, I mean, the two is just because of plus and minus. It's not even Q delta V because all the charge didn't move delta V. The first charge moved zero. The second charge moved a little bit more delta V. Only the very last charge moved the full delta V. Right? So what do you have to do? An integral. Yay, we get to do an integral. The energy of the capacitor, that's a C, the little change in energy is due to moving a little bit of charge while this is happening at delta V. But delta V is not a constant. Oh, this depends on the charge. All right, that's the cool part. So that why, that's why it makes an integral. Let's do it real fast. Oh, you can do it. I know you can do it. Let's uh, charge a capacitor from zero to big Q. Charge, and see what we get for the energy. From zero to Q. That's my Q, that's my capital Q. That means it's not a variable, it's a constant. Then we would say, then let's see, the total char or the total energy on the capacitor, we just got to integrate that. It's the integral from zero to Q of dQ. There's your derivative, or there's your differential. Delta V, but what is delta V? It's a function of Q, but what is it? Oh, it's Q over C. Oh, yes. Q over C. As we move, move more charge between the plates, that Q, that's the variable Q. That's how much charge we've moved. So the delta V that this little dQ is moving at is the charge at the time over the capacitance. Okay, so we just got to integrate Q. Integral of just Q is 1 half Q squared, all right, over C. All right, evaluated from zero to big Q. Got to apply the limits. So you get 1 half Q squared over C big Q squared over C, like that, okay? So the energy depends on how much uh, charge on the capacitor, one half Q squared over C. But that's not, didn't really answer the question, did it? I mean, it did, but we gotta look at it and say something else. Let's see, so we did the integral. You don't have to do the integral. I don't think there's a way we can make that interesting, except just doing that. We want it in terms of Q and delta V. So what you could do is say, I'm going to write C in terms of CV equals Q, right? Say, or one half Q squared over C, but C is, uh, is Q over V. So we could put another Q down here and put a delta V there, right? I know this is stupid. And then we could calculate that and we get one half uh, Q delta V. Right? That's why it's a half. So it's not Q times delta V. It's not 2Q times delta V. The energy of a capacitor depends on, it's just one half Q times delta V. 